Okay, like I was saying, um, uh, welcome to tonight. All right, we'll go ahead and kick off. Um, we're recording tonight on Wednesday night in lieu of Thursday night session, and we'll go ahead and load it to the webinar. So obviously a few of you are online now, and then um, I'm sure the others will be watching it uh, tomorrow or over the weekend. Uh, just to go ahead and um, let you know a few things first. Uh, we are almost finished with all the other videos that we've done up to this point, all the webinar sessions. So we'll be uploading them, I'm hoping, to YouTube by tomorrow. I will send everybody the link, and there'll probably be a passcode to get into it as well. Okay, we've also edited out some of the break times on some of them. Uh, on others, we're still working on, but we figured let's put them up, let everybody be able to see them if you need to fast forward, and then we'll go ahead and um, also work on them, but they'll already be up for anybody who needs them. Um, uh, last week, we went ahead and we, we closed out on confined space. We also closed out on excavation, and then on some on traffic control. Do we have any questions? Did anybody need any clarification? Or anything, or were you guys good with it last week? Okay, good. Okay, great. And um, and everybody also uh, from last week, everyone was also uh, the the videos helped as well, especially those excavation videos. I think we're gonna play them more like during during the video like that. Ask you to log off. The only thing we'll probably ask this time, I know a couple of you had problems logging back in uh, after the videos. I would say if y'all don't mind, just log in and then uh, then take your break. That way we can try to kick off a little bit quicker after break time. Okay. It looks like we'll probably do the same thing tonight, just in Luda, to uh, try to save a little bit of time and then uh, and then also kind of gives everybody I think a little bit better perspective and it was it allowed me to answer a few more questions last week. Okay, great, folks. So we're kicking off. We're back in the field safety book. We're back in the book that we've been in, okay? And um, we're back in this book right here, the field safety book. And we're starting at module four, page one. And we're going to be talking about electrical hazards. Yeah. So when we talk about electrical hazards, let's talk about a few things first. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just type this out, folks, okay? It's going to be easier. Let me just open up a slide right here. Uh, I have a person, his name is Brian Williams, works with a company here in town, and he does a lot of, um, they do a lot of industrial plant work, and he says that their company, they use the acronym Be Safe. so when we're talking about electrical hazards, right? So let me go ahead and put this down here, or here. Anybody who's, has anybody ever heard that before? The acronym Be Safe? I think I'm going to have more of a typing hazard. Okay, so let me tell you what it is, okay? And this is what it'll stand for. First of all, it's going to be burns, okay? Electrocution, shock, arcs, falls, and explosions and fires okay so that's the acronym that his company uses I, th I think it's great it's um you know ever since uh brian used it probably about eight months ago almost a, a year ago in one of my classes and i told them that ever since then uh, I, i'd use it and i give him credit for it for a full year or so uh i think uh i'm almost done and but i'll probably give him credit credit for about another year on it because i think it's a great idea uh anybody like that does that help Maybe when you're talking about hazards and maybe using a mnemonic tool in order to help the people that you may be uh, working with or assisting in the workplace. Okay, great. Good deal. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on, okay? And then you'll see some of those definitions are also going to wind up being right now in our in our green section of the trade terms. So arc, bl arc blast, right? What are we talking about? An explosion similar to like a detonation of dynamite. It occurs during uh, during an arc flash incident, Right. Um, I'll show you some pictures. I'm also going to have you watch some videos uh, during the break, and that'll kind of put some of this into perspective as well. Also, arc fault uh, circuit interrupter. What are we talking about now? We're talking about it's a device. It's uh, we use it to provide protections from the effects of arc faults, right? So basically, what it's going to do is it's going to recognize the characteristics that are unique to arcing, and then um, and then what it's going to ultimately wind up doing is de-energizing the circuit so that it can try to interrupt or, or prevent that arc from uh, happening uh, when it's detected, okay, or prior to <clears throat> to, uh, to having a mishap, okay? And then arc flash boundary. 
arc flash boundary is a little bit harder to explain. Uh, I'm going to give you just the easy way to explain it right now, which is it's the approach limit. Um, it's a distance from where it can explode. And basically, where are you going to be injured? You know, what type of degree injuries and type of degree burns you're going to have from being how close or how far you away from the blast is basically what it is. I'll show you a photo of it probably after the lunch break. I'll show you a, a photo of the arc flash boundary, but I think they also have one in the book. And then also, in addition to that, we have a bolted fault. What are we talking about, right? It's a short circuit or an electrical contact between two conductors at different potentials. So basically, what happens is there winds up being some type of impedance or resistance between them. And, um, and ultimately, um, it'll wind up being uh, reading zero. I'll, I'll kind of explain that to you and, and walk you through it in the, uh, in the book as well. Okay. And then breakdown voltage, the voltage where the insulator has a, has a breakdown, okay, or it ceases to act, you know, as a resistor, okay? So, um, so basically it's damaging in the, cir damaging the circuit. And then uh, equipment ground conductor, you know, what we're talking about basically, we're, we're often talking about ground, you know, either a wire or connector that's going to go ahead and connect either the metal panels, the boxes, or the containers to ground. So, you know, basically what are we talking about? Equipment ground conductor, we're talking about normally a copper wire or some type of aluminum wire going to ground. Okay, uh, it could be a bar as well. It doesn't necessarily uh, like a steel bar or rod. It doesn't necessarily have to be a wire. And then, um, and then for for relation, what are we looking at? It's very rapid. It's irregular uh, contractions um, of muscle fibers of the heart. And ultimately, what it's going to wind up doing is it's going to affect the heartbeat, the pulse, and it could possibly put us into uh, cardiac arrest. Okay. And then GFCI, we all know it. We normally have them in our kitchens and our bathrooms. And what it's basically doing is it's looking for a really, really small, like a, mi a minute amount, uh, 0.5 milliamps basically is what it's looking for. And um, it's looking for a very small amount of leakage. Uh, and if it finds it, uh, what it'll do is it's, it'll find that, that electricity is trying to go to ground and it'll go ahead and interrupt the circuit. It's normally what we have in our showers and our bathrooms um, and our, our kitchen areas, anywhere we have, we have a wet process, pool pumps as well. And then um, insulation, of course, right? What are we talking about? Is what's the non-conductive material around the conductive material. So basically, if you think about a wire, I'm talking about the jacketing around the wire. That's what we're talking about. It would be the, the SO cord or our... Um, some type of extension cord, a perfect example, is anything that's copper or aluminum in it would be the conductor. Anything that is um, anything that is material-based would wind up being the insulator. And then, of course, a shock hazard, right? Dangerous condition that's associated with the possible release of energy. And what's it going to do? It's going to go ahead and har harm employees or, uh, or people that may be in the approach distance of that hazard, okay? So, um, so like I said, there's, there's all your, um, your trade terms for, for this section. And then, of course, if you look down at the bottom of uh, page one right there, module four, uh, anyone working on or near electrical equipment, they might encounter one of the following hazards. What hazards? Shock hazards, arc flash, right? Arc blast at a minimum. And then, like I said, also this whole be safe, right? Burns, electrical, shock, arcs. Uh, they may be shocked and slip or lose their footing, uh, uh, falls. And uh, excuse me, folks, I'm just realizing I missed the S here. And then uh, explosions and fires, okay? So those are pretty much all your hazards that are associated with electrical. Okay, so if you look at section two, excuse me, uh, module four, uh, page uh, page two, I'm going to show you how power gets distributed and transmitted through the community, okay? Normally what will happen is we'll have some type of substation, excuse me, some kind of station or generation plant. If you look at uh, page two at the top left, right, right there in the blue with the four or five stacks at the top, it'll be some type of generation uh, station or um, or um, uh, power substation. Uh, station. And what will happen is it starts sending it from there and then it sends it into transformers. Where a lot of times the first set of transformers, the voltage will actually get stepped up. OK, it'll get stepped up in order to start going into the power to the transmission and distribution lines, basically into our towers and to our uh, electrical lines from their electrical lines. It's going to go into a substation uh, substation. Any of you familiar with substation? You probably find them in your neighborhoods are usually about a half a block long or so. You'll usually see them fenced up with about six or eight foot fence. A bunch of electrical controllers and components in it. Let me show you for anybody who's not familiar.
Who's seen these in your neighborhood? A lot of times you'll find them like on a corner lot. You may find them if you're in a rural area, you'll, you'll find them maybe off of a right of way or something like that. Okay. Usually they're going to be, and I'll tell you the easiest way to determine it is more or less where the power is coming, uh, coming into your community. So let me ask you folks, everybody that's out there, uh, tell me the majority of the power lines in your community, are the majority of them above ground or underground? In Louisiana, or at least New Orleans, almost everything is uh, underground, with the exception of how, all the high voltage. Um, everything, excuse me, I'm sorry, every, just about everything's above ground because we're under the water table. So, uh, so we have almost, almost everything above, almost everything above ground, especially all the high voltage. Anybody out there? Okay, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so the majority of you, or a few of you, are above ground. I got a couple of undergrounds too. Okay, great. Okay, so it just depends on what part of the country we're in. Like I said, if we're usually, if we're above sea level and the more above sea level we are, obviously, uh, and most frequently, they'll usually go underground uh, unless it's really like hard, stable rock or something like that. Um, whereas down here, like I said, just about everything is above ground, okay? Okay, great. So it'll go into a substation like this and then it'll go to our distribution poles. And it'll, basically what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the distribution poles, the distribution pole that is... Um, it is maybe outside of your home if you have above ground. Like I said, most of ours is here. Let me show you. This is what I'm talking about, folks. Okay, a distribution pole like this. Perfect example. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave this picture up while we talk about it. And uh, what will happen is the power will come to this distribution pole. And from the distribution pole, this is what's going to feed businesses. Okay, it's going to feed different... Uh, different businesses, it's going to feed different uh, workplaces, re residences. So what happens is, let me, let me show you what's happening with these wires, okay? Um, in most cases, and this is what a lot of people don't realize, I'm trying to see if I can find a, a picture. Uh, those are all higher voltage. Let's see if I can find some lower voltage ones like the one I just had. Okay, here's a perfect example of what I was going to show you. <clears throat> the lower wires, normally the lower wires on a power pole are going to be your telephone and, and your cable. OK, so usually the lowest pole, the wires on the on a cable are, are the least hazardous. And then what will happen is we'll get in and, what, and then we'll start getting into our secondaries and our primaries up here. OK, wires, secondaries here, our primaries at the top usually on the cross. OK, we'll have a hot, a neutral and a ground. And the grounds are actually coming from the pole into the ground. That's normally like when you see a, a, a copper solid wire or something like that going from the power pole down into the ground, okay? Now, what'll happen is, and let me get a better picture of it, of what I had right there. Um, let's say, let's say here. When our power comes in, what's happening is, they've, it's come in from the, uh, from the transformers, right, to the larger antennas, to the 115,000 to 500,000 volt antennas, into our substation and then it goes into our distribution poles. So by the time it's coming down our distribution poles, we're usually running anywhere from 5,000, say, to 35,000 volts, okay? And what happens is that it goes into a transformer again. Now this transformer that it goes into now before it goes into our home is called a step journal transformer. So this transformer actually is reducing the power now. The first one coming out of the generation station uh, picked up that power, the, the voltage, and now this one is reducing the voltage to get us a manageable uh, power inside of our residence or business, which normally normally when we have coming in, if all we have is 240, let's say, in a home, we'd have a line of 120, a line of 120, and a neutral and a neutral coming into our house, okay? So it would be a hot, a hot, and a, let me get away from that wire, a hot, a hot, and a neutral coming into our, our home. And the reason there's no ground is because the ground is going to come from probably wherever your panel is in your home, and it's going to pick up the ground there, okay? So if you go back to the to the to the figure on the page, you'll see that it goes ahead and goes through a distribution pole, right? Like I said, it goes through a step down transformer, and you see where into our home it's bringing it into one twenty two forty, right? And then into industrial, usually in office buildings, eh, it tends to be the same for the most part. And then every once in a while they'll bring it in uh, two hundred eight to uh, four eighty four eighty four five seventy five six hundred. Okay, just depending on the voltage, like you see in the illustration. Okay. Um, now, also on the um, on the bottom, you'll see that illustration there, and it's a typical body resistance and currents. And what you're seeing is what the different ohms is um, if it's uh, actually traveling through our body. Okay. 
So, um, so there you go. There's an example of, of the ohms and how it's set up. And there's the formula also on how to calculate ohms as well. Okay. Okay. So, um, so if you look on the right hand side, it'll start talking about what milliamps, and that's what I was kind of talking about earlier. You'll see in the right hand side, you'll see it has different milliamps for you. And then also it'll have basically common tools or common equipment that are associated with it. Okay, one thing that we always want to watch out for, look at look at down at the bottom of page three, uh, your uh, figure three is those AEDs. Let me ask your folks, who out there is trained on CPR and AED? Can you chime in and let me know? I'm going to wait a few seconds on that, okay? Okay, good, yeah, a few. Okay, good, a few of you, all right. Okay, and then so you did first aid, you did CPR, and then you did the AED. Well, this is the thing with this AED, and that's why it's so important. And when you know when you do training, the main thing they really have to train us is not to touch that body, right? Or we actually have to, any time that machine is analyzing, we don't want to touch the body because we don't want it to analyze and pick up our heartbeat, right, our, our, our movement or pulse. And it may uh, confuse the AED thinking it may be the patient. And then even more importantly, we definitely do not want to touch the body when, um, when we're about to discharge the shock. Because when we're about to discharge the shock, that shock now can put someone into cardiac arrest, and we could wind up having two health conditions instead of one. Okay, all right, great. Okay, so let, let's 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 go to the next page, and then I'm just going to read one paragraph really quick right there. If you, if you look on page four on the left hand side, um, the skin, right, like it's like any other insulator, right, and it has a breakdown voltage, which is where it's going where it's going to cease to act as a resistor. You know, and simply and it simply punctured. So basically, what happens is we actually become part of the current of the flow uh, after we get to a certain voltage. Okay, and and basically that's what it's saying. So um, so the higher the voltage, obviously the the uh, greater the risk where somebody's going to wind up being a conductor and electricity is going to travel through us in order to get the ground. Okay, and then burns uh, one point one two. You'll see there's risk of burns. Right and now, when we talk about burns, we're talking about thermal. It could be fire from equipment. It could be hot wires. It could be explosion. It could be arcs. Okay, so just depending on on what uh, what what initial risk that we're talking about. And then, um, if you look at one point one three, you'll see there's arc flash. Okay, and it uh, goes on to talk about uh, uh, blast hazards. Let me go. Let me go to another PowerPoint that I have. Um, I just want to show you this really quickly. Uh, who knows? Do me a favor, folks out there. Um, who, who's heard of arc flash? First of all, let's start there. Tell me if you've at least heard of arc flash. Okay, good. Okay. Now let me ask you a question and correct me if I'm wrong. Is it something easy to, is it something really easy to define folks? It's, it's a little complicated, right? Would you, would you agree with, yeah, it's a little complicated, right? To, to, okay. So let me show you what I did. Okay. We went ahead and put this PowerPoint together for a client. Uh, let me pull it and and I'll show it to you really quickly. Okay, basically these are the standard numbers. Here. Oh, this isn't it. This is this is someone else's actually. But there's um, there's some um, this is Pennsylvania Department of Labor. There's the standard numbers. Okay, and there's um, the general industry standard for electrical, the second for electrical, and then the construction standards. Okay, let me see if I can find this for you real quick. What I'm looking for. Let me go back. Okay, here we go. I'm going to do it from here. Basically, here, here's the definition, folks, of an arc flash, okay? It's a phenomenon, right? The way a flashover of electric current, it leaves the intended path, and then it travels through the air from one conductor to another to ground, okay? And it's not that easily stated, but I, I'm gonna explain something in a minute. And then the results are often, what are they? They're violent, right? When humans are involved, when there's property damage, okay? And then it could be a cause serious injury on this. I'll tell, you, <clears throat> I'll tell you why I don't like this, okay? Is because I understand the definition. Um, what I don't like is the whole word phenomenon because I think it's one of those things that it's so hard to explain. So this is what we've done now with our arc flash training is, <clears throat> Just put in a synonym, a synonym for uh, for arc, for a phenomenon. 
So now what is it, right? So look at all these words, right? An occurrence, right? It's a fact. And it's, it's an experience. It's an episode, event, a situation, a case, a happening, a circumstance, an incident. So let, let's go with an event or let's go with a situation, right? And now let's go back to our, 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 our there you go, our slide. So what's an arc flash now? It's just an event, right? Basically, where, where there's a flash over of electric current and it leaves its intended path. So it's supposed to be going through wires. It's supposed to be going through panels, right? And going to the equipment that we service. And bottom line, it leaves that and it's coming out to us. That's the best way I can explain it. And when it comes out to us, it's still going to look for ground. But when it comes out, it comes out at such a velocity that it winds up being, it winds up being, uh, could be a potential injury or even, uh, or even fatality. Okay, that's the degree of, uh, of, of seriousness that it has, okay? So does, does that kind of help a little bit with the whole definition of arc flash, maybe? And it, it gets deeper than that, right? Uh, I definitely wouldn't go around saying uh, you've been arc flash trained, but I, I just kind of try to break it up a little bit. I've got a couple of videos. I'll load those up. Uh, I'll load up those links this week and give them to you. Tonight, I'm going to have you watch one on electrical hazards. It does talk about arc flash a little bit. And then I'm going to have you watch one for... Uh, also for uh, lockout tagout as well. Okay. Okay. So let's let's move on. Um, so let, let's go back to uh, the book now. Right. We were at one point one three. Now we're talking about a flash or a hazard. And then um, you know, and then of course emergency response. Right. What are we talking about? If someone near us has uh, received an electrical shock, basically, um, we're not going to touch that person. Right. You know, if you try to knock them off electricity, the safest and smartest thing to do is you go ahead and de-energize the panel or you de-energize whatever the source is, and then you try to remove them. Because if not, if you tried to grab somebody, and if that current is still going through that person's body, what ultimately what it's going to do is it's going to it's going to go ahead and activate our our um, involuntary muscles, and we could wind up having two again two injuries or two illnesses or fatalities as well. Okay. All right, so then um, if you look at uh, uh, Module 4, Page 5, you know, of course, common power cord hazards, right? You'll see that in the video. We're talking about a good bit of, of hazards related to cords. But if you look at the next page, 6, we'll go through them. And then um, the following, these are important tips, right, that can help protect us from electrical shock. And basically, what are we talking about? We don't want the path of electricity to leave that cord and to come to us, basically. Okay, so what are we talking about? We're never going to tape. Uh, to repair, repair a cord, right? We, we can't repair a cord in the middle. Um, basically, I, once it's been cut, uh, if we can't splice it, what we're going to do is we're just going to pull it out of service. You may want to put an end on it, uh, making a shorter cord out of it, but definitely cannot splice it together and put it back into, and put it back into action, okay? And then never use the cord from which the ground uh, conductor has been pulled out. So what are we talking about on a three-prong? That middle prong, right? But not just pulled out, folks. Also, to the point to where it's so loose, to where it's possibly broken off of the wire, because you know, or it's about to fall out. Anybody had them where you know we've seen them where they're pulled out. Anybody ever seen them where they're actually loose and 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 they're at risk of falling out? Okay, good. Okay, a couple of you. Well, not good, right? But a couple of you. Okay. Um, also, always connecting power tools to a circuit protected by a ground fault interrupter. Bottom line, nowadays, out of risk management, first of all, all tools have to either be double insulated or they have to be grounded. Um, easiest way to do it, we've gone to an evolution of a lot of power tools, right? A lot of battery-operated tools, a lot of air-powered tools. That's the, that's the first and foremost way that we've engineered the hazard out. We've changed the type of tool that we're using. And then when you do have to use tools... What are we looking at? Primarily, it's going to be the electrical, uh, pneumatic, right, air pressure, hydraulic, or a powder actuated tool. It'll probably be one of those for you. Okay? So, um, so making sure, like I said, that uh, that 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 we always connect the power tool to a um, to a grounded uh, receptacle or or a um, or three prong outlet. Okay, with a pre three prong cord or a double insulated tool. And then also be extremely careful when using a power cord. You know, anytime we were using it in a wet, damp environment, keeping it out of water. Um, also, for any reason, let's say if we have a uh, power cord and a extension cord and a uh, 
and a power strip uh, together. We definitely want to watch also where we have those plugs and, and what kind of whether they're exposed to and then make sure that they're tightly sealed together, right, as far as the male and female plugs. And then if you look at your right-hand side, I know we talked about this in the little book, and then but here it is again for you. And, um, and I think it might have been in Chapter 1, actually, now that I think of it, too. But there is what your outlets look like, your receptacle looks like. So when we're talking about receptacle, what we're talking about, we're talking about in the wall, right? So let me let me show you. Let me let me go back to Google. So, of course, we have uh, different electrical receptacle types. When we're talking about receptacle, we're talking about the actual the actual part of that goes into the wall that we're plugging into. Okay, so we're talking about the female when we talk about the receptacle. And then, of course, we'd have the plug, right, which is the actual plug like this that's going to plug into the receptacle. Okay, but there you go. So, so you'll notice right there, perfect example, right, there's different ones. You're looking at the cross-comparison chart on the uh, table. Look at your 20 amp, and there's your 20 amp right there. OK, so uh, so you have different amperages. And like I said, it's got uh, you got different charts on the Internet as well. OK. All right. Good. And then in addition to that, also what we want to do is minimize the risk associated with working around electricity. Right. You know, we, we basically want to have good practices. What are the best practices that we can do? And I'm going on to page eight. It's first and foremost. First and foremost, we can ground. Uh, we have responsibility to ground that panel. And then also, uh, anytime we're using power tools that aren't grounded or are grounded, either way, we're going to put that GFCI in the line. There's an example of the GFC, GFCI uh, extension uh, on your right-hand side of the page, on uh, page 9, figure 8. And let me show you some different ones, different ones that many of you are probably not used to seeing. All these different ones that we're used to use to see in the workplace, okay? Just an example of them right there. There you go. Okay. So, um, so the there there's the different uh, types of uh, of uh, GFCIs, and then of course double insulated tools. Um, I think you saw that last week. We talked about it, right? Also, double insulated tool. And a lot of times what, what happens, it'll be like a polycarbonate or some type of uh, plastic made uh, housing. It, it won't be like the old drills, okay? So um, let's see. And then, of course, like we said, a lot of it's this has been fixed now with um, with what you call These are single insulated with um, power tool, with uh, battery operated tools. But here you go, folks. Uh, look at these right here. Right here, these old craftsmen right here in Black & Decker, those are basically, those are, is what I'm talking about, those are single insulated tools, okay? Our double insulated tools are going to be more tools like this nowadays, uh, has a different housing, right? And uh, more of a polycarbon, like I said, or a plastic housing, okay? Let's see. Okay. So, uh, so just there you go, double insulated tools as well, okay? Okay. Okay. Um, and then, you know, uh, things also, as far as we want to be cautious of, to make sure that we have uh, GFCIs, also arc flash circuit interrupters as well. And there you go. A lot of times, a lot of times the arc flash interrupter will actually wind up going in the panel. Okay, is where it's going to go most of the time. So there's an example of them. A lot of times, does anybody have a pool that's online? Anybody have like, especially a built-in pool? Okay. All right, we got one. Oh, look, we got two. Never mind. Okay. So, um, so you know, basically, a lot of times, what we'll wind up having is like an arc flash interrupter, or we'll wind up having a GFCI with a circuit breaker in line as well. Okay. So, uh, so it could be a combination of, so when you buy, you just want to make sure that you're buying the right, the right breaker for it, whether it's just a regular breaker, whether it's an arc flash interrupter, whether it's a GFCI. 
So uh, just making sure that you're buying the right piece of equipment uh, for the right application, okay? All right, so I'm moving on. I'm going to page 10 now, folks. And then like we talked about, right, Assured Grounding Program. And I'm, I'm going to dig into the Assured Grounding Program just a little bit more. And basically, what are we looking at, right? We're looking at to make sure that, that equipment grounding conductors, our programs will cover all the cord sets, any types of receptacles that are not part of permanent wiring. The reason they wouldn't be part of permanent wiring is because ultimately they're temporary wiring. It may be some type of temporary wiring or outlet that's been installed, okay? And then we also have to be cautious of any equipment that's connected to it by means of a cord, right? And then OSHA, basically, what's OSHA going to require? That uh, we have that the employer have a written description, right, of our ground assurance program or ground assurance equipment uh, program, all right, and then uh, making sure that we that it's site specific and job specific to the hazards that our employees may encounter, okay, and then the program's got to um, got to outline the employee specific procedures uh, for any type of required equipment inspection tools and then um, and then test uh, any test schedules as well, right. Uh, as far as uh, testing our um, GFCIs, let's say breakers or whatever the case is, that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about test. And then, um, and then, as you see, you know, uh, two tests right that are required for ground shortage program. What are we looking at? First of all, the continuity test. And the continuity test. What we'll be doing is, if you look at the right hand side, um, you'll see the two meters, the multimeter at the top left, and then the the meter and multimeter at the bottom right. Uh, that's what we're talking about. They'll set them to the top one is analog because it's a needle and the bottom one is obviously digital because you see the LCD. Okay, which is the newer type. And basically what will happen is if we're going to check continuity, what happens is, is you bring both sides of your uh, cord together. Okay. And uh, you bring both sides of your cord together. And then you basically put those prongs, those red and black prongs that you see there. You'll put one on the ground male side, one on the ground female side. And basically what we're looking for is zero, okay? So let me show you really quickly, okay? Okay, so basically what we're looking for um, is uh, the the picture here. It actually almost like what we have in the book right here. It'll be wind up going to all zeros or one zero if we make in contact with them. Okay, so you'll you'll see it in the video as well. If not, there's resistance in the line. What happens if it if it doesn't go to zero? It's going to have a number, and those numbers start determining how much resistance we actually have in a line. And resistance we have good resistance and bad resistance, right? So let me go back and let me explain the difference. Good resistance. Go to go to the transformers on page. Uh, what was it on page three or five or something like that? Let me see. Let me see what a power generation stuff was. On page two, the power generation, the step down, the step down transform where you see the illustration of the yellow house, right? And we're talking about the 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 transform that we normally find on uh, poles in our residential communities. That's a good that's a good resistance because what that's doing is that's taking a higher voltage power from the thousands and it's reducing it to manageable to manageable or consumable quantities for us, right? And it reduces it down so it steps down the voltage from the five thousand to thirty five thousand all the way down to one hundred and twenty or two hundred and forty volts. Okay, all right. So now that's good resistance. Bad resistance. Bad resistance is in an extension cord because now it may have some resistance and now the ground may not work as well if, if necessary, or it could even also start to heat the cord, okay? All right, any questions so far, folks, about any of this? Are everybody okay so far? Uh, you do, uh, oh, the pool, I'm sorry, okay. Thank you, Sue, sorry about that. I, I thought I saw about the questions. Okay, if you go to the um, go to the next page, page twelve, you'll see it'll be illustrating uh, shock protection there boundaries. Okay, from equipment, and let me show you for arc flash. There are different boundary, there are approach distances. Let me show you what they look like. Okay.
Okay. So these are these are the approach distances. This is how they do it. This is how they do it with uh, with what you call it with uh, arc flash. And you, as you see, right, the darker the color is, red, red, the greater hazard we have. And it starts even telling us who's prohibited in what areas, who's allowed to work in the restricted and even limited duty, okay? So just depending on the type, and normally I'll tell you what it's restricted by. It's gonna be normally three things. The potential hazard, of course, the level of training of the employee and the level of PPE that they have on against resistance to arc flash, okay? So uh, those, are, those are usually the three things that, um, that are the most quantifiable when we're talking about uh, approach distances to, a, uh, to, to panels. Now, let me, let me tell you, folks, if you go back to, do something for me if you would, go back to page two again one more time. We're least resist, we're least probable to have arc flash hazards under 240 volts, okay? So normally, I mean, they're possible, rarely possible uh, within 240, almost never possible um, at 120 because it's a lower voltage. But normally anything over 240, and then we get into the six, the 400s, the 600s, okay, into the thousands, that's where we start accepting a significant risk that there may be an arc flash, okay? All right, great, folks. Okay, so let's keep on going over. Let's keep on going. If you look, if you look down at the uh, illustration on page twelve, you'll see those are temporary ground jumpers. They're basically uh, jumping and grounding those terminals and taking them to the ground to make sure that they have adequate ground. Okay, maybe servicing they're doing, um, and you can go ahead and read on. And it's got that little case study in there or little tidbits if you'd like to read it as well. Okay, so. Um, so the like I said, the boundaries that are listed right there on page 13 is what you're looking at in the chart right there. And if you want to just pull it up, the easiest thing to do is arc flash, like I said, uh, boundary approaches, and then that way you can kind of look at it, okay? But this is one of those things that most employees don't deal with uh, is arc flash. But if you do, we do have to be adequately tested, okay? All right. Um, so if you flip the page now, you'll see a bunch of PPE. And this, now this is not for regular electrical. This is now going to get into arc flash, and it's uh, the arc the four arc flash categories of hazards, depending on the type of PPE that an employee is going to be wearing. And like I said, normally it, it, it'll depend on whether the uh, system is is powered up when they approach it, whether it's powered down, depending on how many volts it's got going to it. All right. Um, so you'll have things like uh, lineman gloves, like the leather gloves that you see there, right? Or, uh, or the gloves on the left-hand side. And then you'll also see um, uh, Salisbury there. Th those are going to be like um, forearm mitts. A lot of times they'll come on the glove already for lineman gloves to protect the forearms. Um, and then, of course, face shields and hoods as well. And then you'll see our arc flash suit down at the bottom right. Okay, shoe covers, uh, pants over the boots, right? Gloves over the sleeves. You know, and the reason you put the gloves over the sleeves, folks, is because imagine imagine this employee has their um, let me give you an example. Imagine this employee has their their hands in a panel and a panel explodes. If the if the sleeves aren't tucked into the gloves, where where's that flash, some of that flash going? Mm-hmm. Yep. Right into the sleeves, right? So uh, from the gloves into the sleeves, that's absolutely correct. Um, okay, so folks, let me let me tell you something. Um, let me kind of give you a heads up here. Who's who's heard of Salisbury before? The um, the PPE for arc flash or for electrical hazards? Anybody out there? Okay, yeah, one. Okay, let me tell you who Salisbury is. Right, Salisbury is um, Honeywell. Okay. So for any of you who are not familiar, uh, uh, chime in. Let me know if uh, – who. okay, let's start with this. Who's familiar with Honeywell? They've made thermostats, thermometers, different equipment like that. Okay. Now, let me tell you everything Honeywell's into, okay? Um, we're doing good on time, so I can kind of sidebar a little bit right here for a minute. Let me, let me explain what Honeywell is into now, okay? Who uh, is familiar with – Okay, so you're not familiar with Salisbury. I don't. I think only one person chimed in, right? 
Um, they're doing boots now. They're doing uh, air monitors now. So let me let me show you. Let me give you an example, okay? Uh, they're buying refineries now. Honey, Honeywell is so far in the game. Oh, that's another thing. Uh, they bought Howard Light. Uh, who's familiar with Howard Light hearing protection? E either Howard Light earmuffs or uh, or um, uh, what, what do you call the uh, earplugs? Okay, they bought North. They also own now. They now they own uh, for fall protection. They own Miller. They own Miller. They own Sala. They own DBI. All of those different fall protection companies now, they own them. Okay, they own Uvex. I mean, a lot of times, did, did any of y'all realize that that uh, Honeywell is so deep into the safety game now? I, that's crazy, huh? Okay, good. Well, you know, I mean, you've got a big, got a big player in the game, and they're, they're getting into all sides of it, right? Electrical, fall protection, uh, eye protection. So, yeah. Uh, hearing protection. So, you know what? Kudos to Honeywell, right? So, okay, good. Okay, so look, let's do this, folks. We are looking at, let me see the time right now. It's 7 and 5 right now. Um, let me show you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk us through a little bit of uh, lockout tagout right now. And then um, let me walk you through. I'm going to walk you through a lockout tagout. Let me show you two videos that I'm going to want you to watch at, at the break and at lunch. We'll do the same thing we did yesterday. Okay, it kind of seemed like it worked out pretty well, and then we can answer any questions if necessary, and then if not, I can recap. So let me um, let me show you the two videos, and we're gonna break. We're gonna easily break today for seven thirty. We'll jump back on for eight, and I'll have you back off for eight fifty. Okay, so um, let me go to YouTube, and I'm gonna bring you to the two videos that I want you to watch today. Okay, the first thing I want you to do is this: I want you to go to YouTube, and I want you to search electrical safety CMA. Okay. When you search, um, uh, Sue, I don't know if you watch these. You might have watched one of the other ones that we uh, that we had access to on YouTube uh, when you were here for the 510. I know most of you, uh, the rest of you, either watch this one or watch the one for actual CMA. But this is Snyder's, um, and then the Panduit, the one I'm going to show you for uh, for lockout tagout, is really good as well. Okay. Yeah, Pat, you. I think you saw them both, Pat. So. Okay, so great. So here we go, folks. So if you go to um, Electrical Safety CMA, watch this one right here. The one that says Snyder Electric. This is a really good electrical hazard. Uh, and it's for non-electricians, which is what most of us are doing. Okay? So um, so I want you to watch that one. And let me show you what the second one is. The second one is going to be Lockout, Tagout, and you're gonna, and Panduit. P-A-N-D-U-I-T. And let me show you what it looks like. It's this one right here, this 14-minute video. So what we'll do is um, I'm going to break you all probably around actually about 725, give you 25 minutes to watch them, all right, and then also another 10 minutes at break, and then we'll jump back on and, and wrap it up that last hour, okay? But watch those two videos for me, and then that one's by Panduit. Um, they've got different videos, but I want you to watch this one, this particular 14-minute and 28-second um, Lockout tag out. It's re it's really great. Okay, so okay, so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about lockout tag out, right? And then um, we're going to talk about a few things. And then of course, you know, I'm gonna kick it off with the uh, I'm gonna kick it off with the uh, trade terms again. First of all, energy isolation devices. What are we talking about? It's any type of mechanical device that physically prevents the transmission, right, or release of of energy, right? What are they going to include? Things like manually operated circuit breakers, uh, disconnect switches, uh, line valves, and blocks. So let me so let me give you let me go to uh, if you go to your next go to your um, go to page nineteen. You'll see some line valves in place there. You'll see some those are actually gate valves. I'm going to show you. I know that I've showed you already. Um, when we talked a little book, we talked uh, whoever was online for the little book. We talked about uh, lockout tagout. We talked about uh, double uh, uh, gate valves and ball valves. I'm going to show you again. And then if you go to page 21 in this module, then you see your energy isolation devices there. You see your, um, what are we talking about? We're talking about the breakers there as well, right? That's the, that's the energy isolation device. And then the lockout device itself is the lockout is, um, is what we're talking about, right? Like the circuit breakers uh, lock 
There you see the master lock on page 21. Also on page 19, all of those are the uh, lockout devices. Okay, so the energy isolation device is the engineer mechanism that's already in place for us to be able to turn the power on and off, right? Breakers, disconnects, items like that, pullouts. And then the lockout tagout device is what we use in order to lock the, um, the energy iso isolation device in its in open position uh, so that we have no energy going to whatever pieces of equipment or, or, or tools or equipment or uh, processing units that we're working on, okay? All right, so I'm going back now to page... Uh, I'm going now back to page uh, 17, I think, or 16. Okay, so that's energy isolation devices, energy source. What are we talking about? You know, anything, right? Electrical, mechanical, hydraulic, pneumatic being air, uh, chemical, thermal, okay? And any other kind of energy when an employee might be injured or lose their quality of life or lose their life altogether. Um, and then, like I said, lockout device we just talked about, right, what they were. And then um, tag out, what are we talking about? We're talking about the actual tag like you see on your right-hand side, danger tags, live wire tags, do not operate tags. Um, all of those are part of our tag out, um, uh, tag out program. And then, um, and then tag out device, right, is any prominent uh, wanted device, uh, like we're talking about, like the tags, that's going to warn us to um, that uh, we have gone ahead and tagged out. And the reason is lock out a tag out with a lock out, we isolate the energy and then we put apply a lock the tag out we isolate the energy and we apply a tag um in believe it or not in general industry in construction it, it is acceptable and it is legal to only tag out however in maritime in osha maritime there's a program called lockout tag out plus and with the lockout tag out plus that means that if and this all started back in 2010 or 2011 that if a piece of equipment now on a maritime vessel is capable of being locked out, it must be locked out. Okay. And then not only that, they went a step further and uh, government said, hey, if it's anything that was revised on a vessel after 2011, basically that if, um, if it, that if it was an energy isolation device, right? Like we're talking about like a gate valve, a blind, um, a breaker, it had to be capable of being locked out now too. Okay. So, Whereas in oil and gas, it's still an option to lock out and or tag out. Um, like I said, now in maritime, it is a requirement to lock out and tag out. Okay. All right. So, um, so there's all your, there are all your, uh, your definitions. We talked about them right now, and then they're in the paragraphs as well. Who's used any? Has anybody used? Look at page seventeen. Anybody out there use uh, lockout, uh, lockout devices like that? You know, like obviously, like your padlock. You know, or your um, your community has that you see on um, on figure fourteen on A. That's a, with all those holes in it, like the Swiss cheese. Um, you're looking at that's a that's a community hasp. So let me go ahead and go to the internet. I'm going to show you. Um, let's see. Anybody out there uh, trained for lockout tagging? Okay, good. Yeah, a few of you do. Let me tell you the best thing you can do, right, is um, if you got some devices like this, like a kit or some devices, pull them out. Let them put their hands on it. It's so much better. Okay? So uh, so there you go, right? Now, now you got different lockout uh, devices there that you can use if necessary as well. Okay? Okay, good. Okay, so um, that's page 17. I'm moving on to page 18. And then we have different isolation devices, right? We have electrical plug lockout. Basically, what it is is you put in. Uh, let me let me show you an example of it. You basically put, and you'll see it in the video as well. You're actually putting the plug into a. Uh, there you go, right there. That's the illustration of what you see at the top one on page eight, 18. This is this is what you're seeing, except it's squared. And basically, what they're doing is they're putting the receptacle in there, or the excuse me, not the receptacle, the plug in there. And then you're locking it so somebody cannot stick the plug into a wall. Okay? So that's an electrical. And then you'll see the breaker lock. Uh, breaker lock, if you go to page uh, 21, you'll see that there's an illustration of the breaker lock in place. Okay? The ball, the ball valve lockout. Let me show you how the ball valve lockout works for anybody. This is going to, the ball valve lockout is going to be for a, uh, uh, let's see, for, for ball valve handle. 
let, let me show you like a ball valve. There you go. So this is what it is, right? These different ones, they, they sell all different types. That's the one that we're looking at right now, basically. And what happens is it's got a handle like this. And it's locking this handle so that people cannot open the handle. Right now, when this handle, the, the screw comes off here. When it's adjusted, it should be uniform as to go this way, perpendicular to the, to the tube when it's shut off and parallel to the tube when it's turned on. Okay? So, so that is what a, uh, that's what a ball valve looks like. And then electrical switch. Basically, you're talking about a light switch at the bottom. Okay? And that's what your light switch looks like. And then if you look, um, you look and, and let's see different things that they're talking about on, on page 18, right? You know, what are we talking about, right? It's important to know how to protect ourselves and our coworkers. So what happens? Everybody has to be aware of the activities that are being done, right, on the site. And they got to understand how to perform them safely. You know, not only that, here's the most common safeguards, right, that have to be kept in place. Hey, never op operate any device switch, right, valve or any type of other equipment, that's been locked out or tagged out. Also, use only tags if you've been approved for your job site. Um, a lot of oil and gas only uses tags. Perfectly acceptable as long as it's not a fail, all right, and as long as they follow the process, the uh, OSHA requirements in the process. Uh, also, uh, if a device valve switch or piece of equipment is locked out, right, make sure that it's uh, properly tagged out as well. Like I said, it's not a mandatory, but it is a best practice uh, to do both, okay? Like I said, uh, we definitely want to do both, but uh, but they're not required to do both. We, OSHA says we can either lock and or tag. Also, lock out and tag uh, all electrical systems, lock out and tag pipelines, right, containing type of acids, explosives, uh, flammable liquids, high-pressure steam, and then also lock and tag uh, motorized equipment and, and, and vehicles, okay, that may require repair as well. Okay, easiest way to not let somebody operate it is lock it out and tag it out or grab the key, right? So, but if you grab the key, make sure it's the only one in, si in circulation. And I would still put a tag on it, let, let employees know that it, that it cannot be safely operated. And then if you look on your right-hand side, figure 17, um, there we have uh, uh, some more lockout devices. Your community has to begin, right? Your locks. And then the... Um, and then the tag. Let me show you something with the OSHA website, okay? OSHA website, let me show you what they say. It's 1910. This is one of the few standards that I do a lot of work in. So it's 1910, uh, 178. And let me show you something real quick. Okay, so I just went to the word, I word searched the word color. And this is what the standard says, that the lockout, the, st the lockouts have to be standardized, okay? And lockout and tag out, right? They have to be standardized within the facility and they have to have at least one of these. I think they should have more, at least two, but they have to have at least one. They either have to be the same color, the same shape, or the same size, okay? And additionally, right, in the case of lockout devices, print and format um, has, to be, has to be standardized as well. That's why most of our tags are standardized. But what do they mean? Uh, let me go back to that picture of the lockout devices, right? Let me see if I had it on here. There you go. You, you'll see, see in different color locks. There you go, right? Uh, different color locks with different applications. So you have some companies that what they'll do, they may grab uh, red for electricity, yellow for gas, okay? Um, black could be utilities, you know, and they'll usually follow, like I showed you yesterday, right? They'll usually follow the 811 color code is usually what they'll follow, but it's not mandatory, okay? So let's see. They'll very often follow these color codes, okay? So there you go. That way, that way all, you know, they because since we're talking about utilities and energy sources, and then lockout, tagout, we're also talking about energy sources, okay? Okay, if you look now, um, uh, section 210, you know, things right in that, an effective lockout, tagout program, what does, what does it have to include? It, we got to inspect equipment by a trained individual, the individual who's thoroughly familiar with the equipment, right? Operation and the associated hazards. Also, we have to identify and label all lockout devices. Uh, we have to purchase locks, tags, and blocks. And then also uh, a tag written operation, right? Procedure. 
that's followed by the employee. So we have to have a minimum of all those things in place. And then the following is an example of typical lockout tagout procedures, right? So here's the procedures that, we're, that we should be following. At a minimum, these four. So what are we looking at? Preparing uh, for lockout tagout, right? Sequence for lockout tagout, um, uh, restoration of energy, and then emergency removal authorization, right? Just in case somebody has to remove it. You'll see a lot of this in the videos that I show you. And then you can also, uh, you can also have it on, you can also check it out in the internet as well. Let's see, here we go. Okay, and then I'll go in the same thing. We'll start talking about the different components, employee components, testing components, okay? So all the different components and the, and the procedures of lockout tagout, okay? Um, what I'll do is when we come back from the video, I'll give you the, uh, actually, I'm sorry, you know what? It's on the next page is the eight-step sequence of a lockout tagout system. So let's go, uh, before we flip the page, you see page 19 there? Uh, page 19, the, all those blue valves, the pipes with the red, with the red handles, uh, with the red valves, those are all gate valves. Let me show you what gates, and let me show you what uh, ball cock valves look like. Let me show you what the difference is, okay? Okay, folks, so here's the gate valve. Here's the ball valve. Let me show you what they're doing. Basically, here's a gate. What happens is when you take a gate and you have a faucet and you have a valve like that uh, on your faucet, when you keep on turning clockwise, it's threading up this disc right here. And when it threads up this disc, what will happen is whatever product will come through, it's going to come up and it's going to go through, okay? So that's a gate valve. Also, so an example of gate valves, like I said, is everything you see on your right-hand side. I'm going to show you a little bit better what it looks like. And then here's a ball valve. This may have a hole in it or this may be solid and flat. And what's going to happen is there's one side that's solid and flat. So when this turns, it's going to break the seal. And I remember talking about this a few weeks ago when we talked about the small book because we were talking about how small the area is where the gas has to go through. Okay. So there you go. There's an example of a gate right there. Okay. So, okay, good. Okay. And then uh, there you go. There's another example of the gate. Another gate, right? Just lifts and it goes through. Okay. All right. So let me uh, move on. If you look at section 212, now we're looking at the, squeeze, the sequence of lockout. And this, is, and this is the sequence as per the OSHA standard, folks. All right. So let's see. Okay. So here you go. This is what we're talking about right here, right? We're talking about the sequence of shutdown. And, and what are we looking at? We're looking at, first of all, we're going to notify all authorized and affected personnel that a lockout tagout is going to be uh, used and explain why it's necessary. Um, give me a moment. I'm going to come back and explain to you who is who, okay, as far as affected and authorized personnel. Um, and then we shut down the equipment, you know, or the system using the normal stop start buttons, right? And you'll see this in the video. So basically, we shut off the equipment. We don't go just disconnecting power and breakers. We actually turn everything off with it's. Um, it's like your TV. Let's say if you're going to move your TV, you just don't unplug it from the wall, right? You're going to power it down first, and then we're going to start disengaging the power, okay? And then we're going to lock out all energy sources, okay, and test disconnects, right, to make sure that they that they, that they they won't fail. So anytime, like, you see the breaker right there on uh, illustration 21, page 21, um, you see the breaker lock. Basically, anytime we put a device on, we want to test it and see if we can make it fail, okay? And then we're going to lock and tag the required switches, right, or the valves, in the open position, and then we're gonna, um, and then each authorized employee has to fix the separate lock. And oil and gas, like I said, a lot of times it'll be group lock. Okay, biggest thing is make sure that all your employees are on point, are trained, and more importantly, trained not to re-energize anything if they don't have authorization to. Okay, and report if they uh, if they run into anything that is uh, that is energized that should not be. And then also dissipate any stored energy by attaching the equipment to a system, uh, to a ground, right, or opening up any valves. Uh, verifying that the test equipment is uh, functional use, using a known power source. Um, also confirming that all switches are in the open position and that we use test equipment to verify. What kind of test equipment? Pressure gauges, okay, the meters and monitors that you saw on the page before, items like that, okay. 
and then um, and quantifiable where they actually have a number on them. Okay, like not a blue, not not a red light, green light, but actual number on it, so we can verify that it's zero state. And then, if any necessary, uh, if it's necessary to temporarily leave the the area upon returning, we got to retest and to ensure that all the equipment's still in a de-energized state. If we leave for the day, we come back the next morning before everybody starts working. We verify that everything is still in the de-energized state. Okay, and then when we restore energy, this is what we're going to do. We're going to completely reassemble, right, and secure the equipment again. We'll put it back together. We're going to confirm that all the equipment and tools. Uh, any type of uh, probes, tools, equipment are out of the way and out of out of the work area before we re-energize. We're going to replace and reactivate all the safety controls, put everything, all the guards, devices back in place. We're going to remove the locks and the tags and isolation switches. Um, and then um, and each employee is going to either remove their own or they're going to log in. We're going to log each employee to, uh, knowing that they're not no longer in an area where they may be harmed when we re-energize. And we're going to notify all affected personnel, right, that the lockout tagout's ended, and then we're going back up live, and then we're going to operate or uh, or close the isolation switches, right, and restore the energy. So that's the that's the that's the six step process that we're going to take in order to uh, lockout tagout. And let me show you affected versus uh, uh, employee. So let's say OSHA lockout tagout. And basically what we're talking about is a, is a work cell. Let me see if I can pull one up. If not, during the break, I'll pull one up because I've got one on my computer somewhere. Um, let's see. Okay, so let's go with, uh, uh, let's go with, give me one second, folks. Okay, I'll, I'll pull one up on the break. And what I basically want to show you is what a work cell looks like. Basically, if we have multiple employees that are working, um, whoever's going to de-energize and doing the work, they're going to be the authorized persons. That's what I'm talking about. And then anybody who is going to be working on the production line, um, those are affected employees, okay? So when it comes to OSHA, we're going to have three employees. We're going to have We're going to have authorized employees, affected employees, and others. So one more time, let me explain them. Authorized is the person who's de-energizing the power and and either the person or the team that's doing the repair right and then we're talking about a processing line let's say or work group and then whoever whoever is affected in that work cell let's say all these employees here perfect example all these employees here they're affected employees they might be harmed okay and the third set of employees is others and others basically mean anybody else who's who's in the workplace that shouldn't be there okay while they're doing it okay all right, folks, so let's do this. As I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to turn off the recording again. I'm going to come off of the screen. Um, let me show you where those two uh, videos are one more time, folks. And then what we'll do is I'll get you to watch those two videos. Um, it'll give you a 10-minute break as well. And then we'll log back on for 8 o'clock, and I'll get you off by 10 minutes and 9 tonight, okay? We're actually making really good time. I was actually, just so you know, we're, I, was, I was figuring on probably just doing that one chapter. But we got way further than we than than anticipated. So when we come back, we'll probably start doing some cleanup work, and then I'm gonna see the next module is kind of long. So I'm gonna see if we're gonna get. I mean, a little bit longer than I wanted it to be. So we're gonna see if we're gonna get into it and start it, or if we're just gonna uh, pause and and maybe um, throw in some review or something like that. Okay. All right, folks. So um, so hang tight, and then let me show you these videos, and then we'll take a break. Okay. Okay. So the lockout tag out. If you do lockout tag out Panduit. P-A-N-D-U-I-T-E, and enter. It's this one right here, the second one, okay, which is 14 minutes and 28 seconds, and right here it says Panduit. Check that out. It's a great video, okay? And the second one is going to be electrical safety, CMA, and it's going to be this 9 minute and 21 uh, minute safety right here from Schneider Electric, Okay. You got some other ones. You got some preview ones in there, but those are two really, really good ones. We have another one that we used to use, but they no longer have it on uh, YouTube, so we quit using it now since they don't have it on there anymore. All right, folks, so um, 
It's uh, 730 when we do this. Is that 25 minutes of videos. Well, won't reconvene at 805, okay? We'll start getting back online at 8 o'clock. Just make sure that your computer's working. 805, and we're off the line by 10 minutes to 9 tonight, okay? Thank you all. All right, see you all in a bit. Okay, folks, we are, let's give me one second, let's see. Okay, there we go. Um, can you all just check in? Let me know that you hear me and that you're back online. I think I see everybody back on. Let's see. Okay, great. Okay, cool. Everybody that's back on, so let's go ahead and... Uh, Let's go ahead and crank it out, okay? So uh, we're gonna go ahead and pick up on module five now. And module five should move pretty easily, and I'll tell you why, we've talked about a lot of it already. It's things that we talk about on a re everyday basis. Um, I'm also gonna show you some videos, and I'm gonna send you a link, folks, all right? I'm gonna be sending everybody a link for it as well. So let's go ahead and talk about it. Uh, let's go to section, let's go to module five, page one. Okay, and then I'm gonna let you read the, uh, read the um, the key terms and industry terms after just really quickly, right? Things that we know about body harness connectors, okay, uh, free fall, right? Basically, you know, when somebody begins to fall, they're falling free until they're actually arrested or are, are caught by something. Um, then lanyard, leading edge, leading edge. This one I do want to. Uh, this one I do want to cover because there seems to be some confusion. And this is what it is, right? Edge of the floor, roof, or formwork. Or any other walking surface where basically what's going to happen is somebody's going to fall off so it could be on top of a roof with a skylight it could be on the end of a dock okay it could be on the end of a dock it could be any any location so um where somebody may be falling off from unprotected edge um a couple of you i saw just signed in we just picked up right now we just uh started we're on module five page one and we we're just talking about the trade terms okay so uh, the majority of uh, body connector excuse me, body harness connector, uh, lanyard. Uh, we just talked about a leading edge, basically anything leading to a fall. Uh, it could be off the edge of a roof. It could be a skylight. It could be a void or an opening. Um, I tell people uh, anytime you want to think about leading edge is just, just think if it leads to a fall. It's the, it's the easiest way to do it, okay? Um, and then, of course, lifeline. What are we talking about lifeline? We're talking, let me just go ahead and show you really quickly. going to make it life easier for us. Okay, so lifelines, uh, items that we're talking about. Can uh, One second. Uh, can you let me know if you hear me, folks? I'm looking for my audio. Okay, I see it now. Okay, I think you hear me okay, huh? Okay, good. Okay, so lifeline. Uh, this, this, is what I'm, this is what I'm talking about right here. Let's see. For anybody who's not familiar, here, here's a perfect example of right there. There's a perfect example of lifeline. They're tying off to a cabling system. Okay, they either have a yo-yo on them or they'll have lanyard on them or a tether line. And it'll depend on how far they can go out. It may be used as fall positioning if it does not let them, or fall restraint, if it does not let them get all the way to the edge and possibly fall off. Or it could be fall arrest if the lanyard is long enough to allow them to go off of the end. Okay, so uh, so there's, there's a perfect example of uh, different types of lifelines that you have. Okay, so folks, so, so everybody that you know, these lifelines here are supposed to be capable of holding... Uh, um, 5,000 pounds per person or two to one engineered ratio. Okay. So, but, um, these right here, these are also called rich cap, uh, D rings, or these are actually chains now anchor points. And you'll have a D ring like that as well. Okay. But, uh, but there you go where there, there's a lifeline that's actually being built into the system. Okay. All right. Uh, so let me, uh, so then we've got personal follow rest system. What are we talking about? Right. You know, the whole ABCD we'll talk about on the next page, anchor, body harness, connectors, decelerators. And then um, platform, basically it's a work surface that's elevated right above a lower surface. Um, and basically it, somebody can, there can be a, a risk of fall, right? Like wooden planks, fabricated planks, decks uh, where somebody may fall off or fall through possibly. And then self-retracting lanyards, 
basically it's a decelerated lanyard where um where it's gonna go ahead and just uh, slowly uh, lower them down after the fall okay so um so of course where there are greatest hazards could be scaffolding ladders leading edges are huge uh ramps or runways uh, also wall wall and floor openings uh roofs excavations pits and wells concrete forms unprotected sides or edges all, all of those are perfect examples of risk of where we may be fall if we are be injured right um, if you move on to page two in module five um, the following safe practice is this what we can do to help prevent falls basically first of all wear safe strong uh, working footwear right that's in good shape i tell people if we're going to be on elevated work platforms my recommendation is to be in laced shoes be in some type of laced boot okay um especially if it's on an incline okay if it's a flat roof something like you see these these men working in right here that may be one thing anytime we're on an incline i definitely want my employees in uh in laced up boots because they're going to be standing at all different types of angles and i want them to have as much uh, leg and ankle and foot support as possible okay um, also if they are wearing lace shoes i want them adequately laced and appropriately uh, snug for them as well okay um in addition to that right also watching where we step be sure that our foot is secure. Don't allow ourselves to get in awkward positions. Uh, stay in control of our movements at all times. Also maintain clean, smooth walking surfaces, basically housekeeping, right? Keep things in good shape or clean shape. Fill holes, ruts, or cracks uh, so that there are no trip hazards. Uh, clean up slipping material or litter. If we if we drop anything like a hydrocarbon or any type of other wet fluid there, there may be a risk on. We want to make sure we get that cleaned up as quickly as possible. Also install cables, extension cords, or other hoses where they're not going to become a trip hazard. And then don't run on any type of scaffolding, uh, wood, roof deck, or elevator work platforms. And then I'm going to add another one in there, folks. And you've heard me say this in the small book. You'll hear me say it over and over again during scaffolds. You'll hear me say it during rooftops, elevator work surfaces, even same surfaces, is don't walk backwards. It's something that we regularly do. And... And so many of our issues happen when we're walking backwards, okay? So uh, because we, we lose vision and, and we start to acquire that complacency. So if at all possible, go ahead and minimize the risk of it. All right, so let's talk about that uh, the safety requirements for your personal fall arrest system. And I'm going to show you some videos, folks. I'm going to leave you with uh, – I've got – let me look at my list really quickly. I've got a handful of videos that I'm going to leave you for tonight. Um, I'm going to show you where they are, and then also I've got them all going into an email – so I'll have all the links for you set up so you'll be able to take a look at it. I've got two on falls. I've got one on ladders. I've got two on scaffolds. So I've got five or six videos that I'm going to leave you with over the next few days. So just whenever you get a moment to look at them, I think that'd be great. Okay. And I think they'll really uh, give you some more insight as well. So um, let's see. Yeah. Two falls, one ladder, two scaffolds, and then the electrical and the lockout tag out as well. Um, come to think of it, how was the lockout tag out and the electrical? Were, you, were all of you okay with it? Was it... Did it help kind of tie in together everything we talked about? Okay, good. Okay, all right, if anybody's got any questions, just feel free to reach out on it, okay? And, and, and then we'll talk about it, okay? But I think if anything, it ties together the material that we talked about. Um, okay, good, so uh, safety requirements for personal fall arrest system, right? So, you know, what are we looking at? And, and, and I'll get into this standard just a little bit more right here. Uh, personal fall arrest systems, what are we looking at? Hey, we're combining several pieces together, right, in order to make one fall protective system that uh, that will cover us. Also, one size doesn't fit all, right? We've got to make sure that we've got the appropriately sized uh, equipment for the appropriately sized person. Um, we also want to make sure that we meet the OSHA standards. And the the, the builders of PPE are built to uh, – the PPE is built to ANSI standards and to OSHA standards in order to, to meet it, okay? And then um, things like this, like – uh, let's talk about personal fall of rest, right? Let's talk about uh, certain characteristics of it. Okay, first of all, the maximum rest in force has to be 1,800 pounds. Um, we always hear 5,000 pounds, right? But but ultimately, that lanyard, it cannot, the 5,000 is the, is, the, is the weight it should hold, the anchor point. But the arresting force itself, they don't want our body being stopped at a greater than 1,800 pounds if we're in a free fall, Okay. And then the free fall distance, the most we can fall without our fall protection catching in is six feet, okay? And then also we have to bring the body uh, to a stop within three and a half feet after that. So let's go to our shock absorber. Let me give you a perfect example. 
Uh, let me go back to uh, last week's PowerPoint. I think that's where I had that Miller uh, fall. Uh, let, let's see. Okay, so this this is what I'm talking about right here. Let's see. Okay, so the furthest we can free fall is six feet. Okay, and then we have to have a decelerator, and the longest that decelerator can be is three and a half feet. Okay, the the decelerator can't be longer than three and a half feet because if not, manufacturers are probably be making them at different sizes, and then what will happen is we really can't calculate a fall distance. Okay, so that's why we need to make sure that it's standardized. Um, also, in, to, in addition to that, it's got to be strong enough. That fall protection system has got to be strong enough to hold 5,000 pounds or twice the possible force um, of, a, of a rusty body force. Now, when we talk about twice the possible force, that's what a lot of people, we all say 5,000 pounds, right? But uh, most of the time, it's a two to one engineered ratio. And let me show you what I'm talking about. Um, so you see on line item one, right? The bullet point at body saw harness, it says 1,800 pounds. Now, let me show you a shock absorber, and I think actually, I'll tell you what, I think it's in that PowerPoint, as a matter of fact. Here you go, right here. That shock absorber, don't, don't worry about this one here, okay? But let's look at this one right here, the six pounder. Um, they're bringing us down to 900 pounds. So what they're doing is they've engineered a two to one ratio on this, on this lanyard in order to bring our arresting forces down to 900 pounds, which is half of what the OSHA standard is, all right? And that's what and and that's what that is talking about. So when you look at or twice the possible arresting force, there you go. If the arresting force is 18, 1,800 pounds, they're bringing us down to under nine hundred, okay. And then therefore they've got that two to one engineered ratio. So that's that's what that means if you ever see it, okay. Um, it could be there, it could be on the lanyard, okay. And what happens is basically we're putting less tension and less jolt on the uh, on all the components of the fall system, okay. All right, great, folks. So, you know, in addition to that, what else do we have to do, right? We have to make sure that we meet all the ANSI standards uh, for our personal fall arrest. If you see PFAS, that's what it stands for, okay? We need to make sure, because ANSI, ANSI publishes the standards related to fall protection. Also, we need to make sure that it's got all the certifications for ANSI on the fall protection. It won't have anything about being certified with OSHA, but it will say that it's either certified through ANSI or it will tell us um, under ANSI 359, which is the fall protection standard, just like our safety glasses are ANSI Z87, fall protection is ANSI standards 359 or 359.2, and that's what uh, standard it will say that it's compliant with, okay? Um, in addition to that, also we'll make sure, we have to make sure that competent persons, uh, that somebody's competent uh, in order to advise employees how to safely wear their PPE and can make any decisions if necessary, um, in, in order to make any decisions if necessary, or to pick the appropriate type of fall protection as well, okay? So that's gonna be under the direction of a competent person that's gonna wind up doing that type of inspection. And then of course you see the inspection tag there, the labeling on figure one at the bottom of page two, module five. And then on your right hand side, folks, A, B, C, and I'm gonna go as far as D's of fall protection. Okay, A is your body anchor. You see it between the shoulder blades in the back. That is the only D-ring that's acceptable for fall arrest, okay? Any other D-ring, if you have them on that harness, is going to be strictly for positioning or for retrieval or rescue only. So the only one that can be used for fall arrest is the one square between your shoulder blades and your back, okay? And then we've got our body, uh, our body harness, right, for B. And then the connectors. What are we talking about? Connectors could be an anchor point, a pad eye. It could be a tie back, like you see right there in the illustration. Um, you see an anchor point or a beam. Or a beam uh, it looks like a looks like a beam toggle up in the upper right hand corner. I'm going to show you some of those right now, and I'm going to show you different ways to tie off onto iron into concrete. Okay, so um, so it could be a, a one of those beam toggles, or it could be a tie back, like you see on the bottom right hand side, where the employee's in that uh, in that strap going around. Okay, and let me give you another example of the strap or the yo yo. Or the retractable as well okay let's see here we go right here so here um here's your traditional anchor right a pad okay a pad eye either may be welded usually bolted in and then it may also be a tie back device which you're seeing down here in the picture page three of the book 
and then it could be SRL or yo-yo, which you're seeing right, right around uh, picture C in the book between A and C right there. And that, that red uh, box, that yo-yo or retractable, that's what I'm talking about, okay? All right, good. Okay, if you look at the next page, there's your typical anchor point. That's what I was just talking about. Okay, it may be like that or maybe on a toggle base. So let me show you what the toggle base ones look like. Okay, so here we go, folks, okay? So you'll have some of these D-rings, like for rooftops like this. That's kind of what you just saw in that picture with the chains, the one I showed you, okay? You have them bolted like this into steel, where they'll have either uh, thread, they'll be threaded bolts or um, with uh, nuts and bolts, or the one that being just um, like wood bolts or something, but they have to be the right dimension and the right strength, okay? Also, a tie-back device. It looks like it's basically it's a choker, but for fall protection, tie back device made out of uh, uh, cabling or out of synthetic. And you'll see how this one has dunnage on it or it is reinforced all the way around, okay? And then this is called the beamer right here. I don't think it's a great picture. I'll get you another picture of it. But what it is, you tie it around the beam clamp. It's actually upside down right now. Let me, uh, or right side up, whatever. Uh, you can have one like this that's on a dolly, ties on to, a, um, to an I-beam, okay? That's what we're looking at right here right now. This one's made from masonry. It opens up, uh, flares out. Uh, let's see. There you go. There's a beamer again right there. But just imagine that beamer flipped upside down is how it works. Okay, it'll be on the bottom side as the employee's traveling. Okay, it'll kind of be like this. It'll kind of be tied up like that, like what you see right there. Okay. Let's see. It can be on the top side if the employee's walking. If the employee's walking also, you can have stanchions. Okay, so we, we have all different types of fall protection now that's available. So you saw what I did, right? All I did was just fall protection and then steel, because I want to talk about steel. I'm going to do concrete in just a second. And then uh, here you go. This is the plunger type I was talking about. What happens is if you push that button, it's going to turn, it's going to turn this little lever right here. It allows an employee to put it through the steel and then let it go, and it's going to tie in, and the steel beam will tie in right here, okay? So just all different types of fall protection that you see that we have available now, okay? Here's a carabiner for anybody who doesn't know what a carabiner is, okay? So uh, so there you go. And then let me just do concrete real quick, and I'll, I'll show you a couple more. And then here's all different ones for, for concrete. A lot of times, I'm going to tell you, they go in there, they don't come out that easily. So when you're bidding them, you probably want to bid or to leave them. Or to cut them off because a lot of times you only get one good use out of them. Okay, so there you go, folks. So there's a bunch of different uh, different types of fall protection in there for you. All right, and then of course uh, you're looking at uh, look at figure four. There's your D-ring on the back shoulder blades. Like I said, that's the only one that's acceptable for fall protection. And then if you look at figure five, now it's showing the shoulder straps, chest straps, leg straps, right? And we want to make sure that it's tight but not overly tight. Um, I'm sending you those videos. Look, folks, just to let you know, the videos that I'm sending you, some of them are going to talk about California Workers' Compensation Fund and Cal OSHA, California OSHA. Um, in, the, in the ones that I'm sending you, there's no difference between California OSHA and at least not in the ones I'm sending you and um, regular OSHA. Sometimes Cal OSHA tends to be a little bit more stringent, but in this particular case, it's, it's pretty much all in line with each other. Okay. Okay. So, um, so if you keep on going... You'll see that it's uh, on the next page. You'll see uh, how to don and wear a harness properly. Okay, you'll see it in the videos that I show you as well. But there you go, right? You want to hold it and shake it by the D-ring. You know, if the chest or the leg straps, right, at a buckle, I'll release them and straighten them all out. You know, slips the straps over your shoulders, <clears throat> right? Then locate that D-ring in the middle of our back. We're going to pull the leg straps, tighten them up, get them snug. Then we're going to go to the chest. And then while after, everything's been buckled up. What are we going to do? We're going to go ahead and check for snugness and tightness in it, okay? Um, look at uh, figure seven, perfect example, right, of an employee. And if you look at that employee, what they're doing is those are called stirrups, folks. And um, what it is, it's a little pack that's on that employee's uh, side pouch, a, a little pouch on it. And what it is is that it's basically there so that the employee can try to hang them, hopefully if they're still conscious, and put their feet in them in order to take the pressure off of the uh, veins and arteries in their leg, okay? So let me let me show you really quickly. Um, let me see. 
show you some different ones. Here you go. So there's all there's all types of different ones coming out these days, folks. So you have the one that's like this, uh, one individual one for each one. Um, the the strap it's about it's only about three quarters of an inch nylon strap with a little hook. You got to kind of hook it and get it under your feet. It's kind of a pain, um, you know. But if you're suspended up there, uh, it gives you a lot more time to be suspended without taking any uh, without having the risk of uh, or minimizing the risk of toxic blood syndrome because the, the blood's flowing down to the legs and not coming back up or vice versa. And then here's what the packs look like normally, okay? And those will go pack, those will go right here, basically around your hip, and you'll put one on each side, okay? So it's there just in case you ever need to check it out and look for it, all right, folks? Like I said, a lot of times they just call them, uh, from my understanding, they just, they're, their stirrups is what they are. They've got, let me see if I can find the 3M one really quickly. Uh, they have a 3M. It kind of almost looks like a little Jacob's ladder. I don't know how else to better explain it, uh, but uh, but just great products overall. Okay, so uh, so just just keep an eye on it, and then you know if you ever see it, uh, if you can have the opportunity to get your employer to order them, I definitely recommend them. Okay, all right, and then like I said, on the right hand side, you can also see the carabiner. Carabiner is not those 99 cent hooks that you buy at Home Depot for your keys, right? That carabiner is going to be double action. That means it can't just push in. You have to actually turn and twist and spin that. Up about a quarter a quarter of the way, about 90 degrees, and then it's going to push in, okay? So it's dual action. And like I said, if you look at it, that's a that's a Miller carabiner there. Uh, look at the next page, and you'll see the gate. You'll see your gate, okay, for your lanyard, your hook, excuse me, and it's got the gate on it. Okay, gate meaning uh, where it opens up. Can't have single action. It's got to be a dual action. That's why you got to push from one side and then push from the other, and that's because it's intentionally... Uh, purposeful that we're going to open it then you see a lanyard with a shock absorber built in there right like many of us know about and then you have a non-shock absorber lanyard on your right hand on your right hand side okay there there you're going to have a non uh you know a non-shock uh, absorbing lanyard those non-shock absorbing lanyards just so you know are normally four feet or less Okay, I don't even think I'm seeing. I don't remember seeing one longer than maybe four or five feet. I'm definitely not seeing them six feet because of the shock, because of the uh, resting force uh, that uh, don't want to put the employee into. Okay, so but there there's one without without a pack in it. And you has anybody? When's the last time somebody really saw one without a uh, a shock absorber in it? M must have been a while, huh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's been a while, so, okay? But but it's there if you need it, okay? Uh, all the information. And then if you look at uh, uh, figure 12 on page 10, there you have your uh, your Y configured, right, or your double lanyard uh, for 100% tie-off. So, folks, anybody who's not familiar, I think everybody just about online up from, uh, by looking at the names, I think everybody's familiar with 100% tie-off, and that's what we're looking at. Instead of having two, two lanyards with two anchor points, behind your connectors behind your shoulder blade you only have one and then you have two hooks right you tie one off if you get to a section where you have to pull one off in order to keep on going you click the second one on and then that way you keep on alternating like that okay and then also on your right hand side you'll see that self-retractable lanyard there uh, that's a falcon lanyard and these lanyards folks just so you know they come in different sizes different lengths they come in different compositions as well their capacity will also will normally be determined by the diameter of the wire rope that's in it, if it's cable, or the thickness and the width of the um, of the synthetic uh, material, if it's uh, synthetic. Okay. One thing I want to show you about that: uh, anybody that's online, do you know how to tell um, how far out? A lot of people ask how far out you can go on a SRL. Let me show you how you can tell. Okay, if I can find it on here. Uh, most of us think it's feet, but it's not feet. It's going to be in degrees. And let's see. I may have to take a picture of this for you. I mean, I, I'm going to go back to that Miller picture if not. Okay, here we go right here. 30 degrees. This is what I'm talking about. So if you're in that SRL, what's going to happen is you have 30 degrees. Okay? From one end to the other. So you actually have 15 degrees and then 15 degrees. And it'll be a total of 30 degrees angle that you can have on that um, on that SRL, okay? 
Um, uh, some of them will wind up saying, I thought they were 30 degrees each way. And I'll, ver I'll verify that uh, this week. I'm going to go back to like the Miller SRLs that we have and, um, and see if it's, I thought it was 30 degrees both ways, not just from the center. Because if you start doing, and the way you have to do the math on distance of walking is how much, how much uh, lanyard do you have out, right? Or yo-yo do you have out? And then, and then how much can you go out? And you're going to get into the Pythagorean theorem. That's the only way you can really calculate your distance on it. And here you go here. This is what I was kind of talking about. Okay. So, um, so it goes back to the whole A squared plus B squared equals C squared is an easy way to calculate it out. So, um, so we'll, I'm going to double check on that 30 degrees this week. And I want to make sure. Uh, for some reason, I thought it was 30 degrees just on one side, from one side and then 30 degrees from the other. But I'll, but I'll verify that, okay? And, um, and then I'll also compare it with, uh, with heights for next week just so you actually know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you numbers like, you know, 10-foot anchor point up above, right? A 15, 20-foot anchor point. And then that way you'll know how far left and how far right or front and back an employee can go, okay? All right. So, uh, so, so and then... Um, you know, of course, guardrails, safety nets, and then uh, safety climbing devices as well are always options for fall protection as well. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, um, the um, uh, guardrails are actually preferred. So if we're on a rooftop, OSHA actually prefers that we use not, I'm not talking about uh, control work access zones now, I'm talking about actual guardrails. OSHA prefers that we use the guardrails, okay? So, and then of course we have options of safety nets. And if you look at the next page, you'll see that you have two things there. You have the guardrail system. And guardrail system, just so we're all, just so we're all familiar, a guardrail in construction, in general industry, uh, let, me, let me do your guardrail heights for you. In general industry, 1900s, right, 1910s, the guardrail height is 42 inches, folks. Okay, the top the top guardrail is 42. The mid rail is uh, the mid rail is 24. Let me go to let's see if I turn. Okay, so these guardrails here, sorry about that. I wanted to find the right picture for you. Okay, here you go, folks. So it kind of looks like the picture that we're looking at, right? It's, it's an illustration of the same picture with the person in it now. If you look at it, it's actually the same screenshot, right? Um, this top rail here is going to be 42 inches in general industry, if it was general industry, and it would be 21 inches in mid-rail in, uh, in general industry. If this is construction, the difference will be that the top rail now in construction, we have a little bit of tolerance. It would be 42 inches plus or minus three inches, but ideal is always still 42. Okay, but we do have a tolerance of plus or minus three inches in construction on this top rail. Okay. All right, and then and then at the bottom, if you notice, you'll see a you have you see a, ca a rope grab, a cable grab there. Basically, what that cable grab does, it's it, it works as a brake. Okay, if you look at it, look at where the carabiner is, and you see that little arm. So when the employee walks up, they can walk up without any tension at all. And as they come down, if they're coming down slow enough, it'll let them slide down slowly with it. But if they fall, it's going to engage that brake where that little arm is, and it's going to grab that cable, and it's going to hold on and bite onto the cable, okay? So you actually have a cable grab, folks, and then you also have a rope grab. And let me show you. It looks almost exactly the same, okay? So let's see. And one thing you want to make sure is it's only one directional. So that grab, that rope grab only works in one direction. So here you go. Here's a perfect example of a rope grab. Okay, same thing, okay? So that brake engages, and it that brake is going to engage right here, and it's going to lock in and bite into that rope, not to allow the person to fall any deeper, okay? So that's what that's for. Here's a better illustration of it right here, folks, okay? So... So what happens is, as long as they're walking up, it slides up. If they're walking down, it slides down. But if you put enough force on this, it's going to take this right here, and it's going to push it down. That's why it's a pivoted here on these, I'll call them hinges or grommets or whatever rivets that you want to call them. And when it pulls down, what it does is engages some teeth that it's got inside of this rope grab 
to bite onto that rope. Okay. Okay, great, folks. Okay. Uh, any questions for, so far? We're going to roll into ladders. It looks like uh, we're going to be really close to uh, trying to push through. It's. Uh, it looks like I, I think we're going to make it in the next 20, 25 minutes. Uh, ladders tend to be really quickly, really quick. And um, there's just a little bit of aerial lifts in here. Uh, does anybody have any questions so far? Are we okay so far? Okay. All right. So let's, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's move on to ladders. Take a look at the ladders on page. Take a look at um, page uh, 15 for the ladders. And let me show you, let me pull up the OSHA fact sheet really quickly. I'm going to let you read through just a few moments so you can read all the different parts of the ladder. Okay. I'm, I'm going to do the, I'm going to do two ladders. I'm going to do the A-frame ladder and I'm going to do the step ladder. Okay. They have the ones in NCCR, but I really like OSHA's fact sheet because they have a lot more information on it. Okay. Okay, folks, so there, there is your step ladder for OSHA, and there are all your components. I'll let you read that for a second just so you can kind of familiarize yourself with the parts, okay? Okay, good. Okay, so now you see, right? We got the anti -sli the anti slip or slip resistant feet at the bottom. We got steps on the ladder, spread of bars. Okay, um, the rear side rails, the front side rails, and then we got the top shelf and then the toe cap, the both that we don't stand on, as we all know. Also, in addition to that, um, you'll see that here are the duty ratings, right, for weight classifications. All right. One thing I want you to know is that these weight classifications here. This is the load that we can put on that ladder, including the employee and any tools or material that they're carrying. Okay. But also the good thing is that these ladders have to be engineered as per ANSI to be able to hold four times their intended load. Okay. So let me show you this really quickly, folks. Um, I know I showed it to you in the last book. I'll show it to you again. It's Warner ladder, uh, Warner color codes on ladders. I don't think uh, Louisville, I don't think they're standardized yet. And if they are, I'm not aware of it. Um, or it's not the same standardized, uh, maybe that's a better way to put it. It's not the same standardized code, but let me show you really quickly. Anybody who's not familiar. So the, these, here you go. This, what we're looking at right now is the, um, is the color code for ladders for Werner. So if you have a ladder that's yellow, it holds 375 pounds, a ladder that's on, and these are fiberglass ladders. If the ladder's orange, it'll hold 300 blue will hold 225 excuse me, 250, green will hold 225, and red, it's not It's not shown here, will hold 200 pounds, okay? So the ladders are color-coded by weight rating in a, in a Warner for fiberglass, or if you decide you want to get an aluminum, which obviously we know we're not going to be using them around, haz around electrical hazards, it's going to be the color of the caps, and the color of any ropes. So here you go, folks. So green, that's going to tell me that's a 225-pound ladder. Okay. Uh, blue, that's going to tell me that's a 250-pound ladder. So we're following the same color code, there you go, that I just showed you. The only difference is now it's the color of the caps as opposed to the color of the rails, with the exception of a black cap. Um, Warner had not had um, orange cap ladders and aluminum. What they did is they would actually, in lieu of an orange cap, uh, in the fiberglass, they used an orange frame, but in a aluminum ladder, they used a black cap. Okay. So either orange or black, they're both going to meet the same thing, 300 pounds. So just so you know, okay, there you go. And like I said, the way I got to it, all I did literally just did was do Warner color codes. And it was the first thing that came up. Okay. All right. Great folks. Um, so that is, that is your step ladder. Now let's go to your, uh, Let's go to your, um, which call it ladder now? Your fixed ladder? Your, excuse me, your extension ladder? So 
So here's a fact sheet for an extension ladder, and th and there are your parts, folks. Okay, same thing, right? You see now, now it's the anti skid still, but it's the foot pad or the or the foot assembly. Okay, um, you see the locks now, the rails again, the rope, the rungs. Now it's not steps. Now they're rungs. Okay, and then the end caps on the top, right? And then this one is called the the base. And then this one that goes up is called the fly. So it's the base and the fly. Okay. All right. So now you know all the, or at least now you see all the components of the ladder, folks. And like I said, the biggest things I want you to remember is this. And let me give you some numbers on this right now too, right? Is like I said, the, um, it's on a step ladder, they're steps. On a extension ladder, they're rungs. Both ladders must be a minimum in width here of 16 inches in width. That's the minimum width it can be. From rung to rung or step to step has to be 12 inches, okay? And they all have to be able to hold four times their intended load. And of course, as you know, we don't use a step ladder like we use an extension ladder, right? We'd never lean it, we open it up. And then as far as this, uh, this extension ladder, whenever we open it up, we're gonna go to our four to one ratio. For every four feet we go up, we're gonna kick it out one feet, right? So one foot, excuse me. So. Uh, so just a traditional four to one, uh, re regulations, right? And then, um, of course, if you look at page 15, also, you see your rolling ladder as well there. The biggest thing with the rolling ladders, a lot of people may not be aware of is that you can actually kick the step down and you can actually lock the wheels in place. Okay. And it's, um, and it's, it's safer for everybody. And then you've got your handrails, guardrails, and then all your rungs and steps are all uniform as well. Okay. And then I'm looking at page 14, right? Keep the following precautions in mind. Hey, don't use an aluminum ladder, whether there's electrical hazards. We just talked about that. Placing the ladder on stable manner. Um, another urban legend. Ladders are not required to be tied off at the top or the bottom. The only time they're required to be tied off is any time that they're not on stable ground or there may be a risk of them falling or it becomes a corporate standard within the organizations that we're working for, okay, or in environments we're working in. Also place the ladder so that it leaves at least six inches of clearance in the back of the ladder, right? and 30 inches of clearance in the front of the ladder. Why? So we're not squeezing between something to climb up. And so our boots or our shoes have enough space to where our heel can go all the way to the rung, to the rung, okay? And then place the ladder so that it leans against a solid or immovable surface. We all know that. We're gonna face the ladder anytime we're ascending or descending. We're gonna climb or descend the ladder one rung at a time. We're not gonna skip rungs. Um, we're not gonna slide up or down the ladder either. And then um, we're not going to use the ladder during high wind conditions. Uh, we're going to check to make sure that all the soles of our shoes are free of all mud and grease, as well as the steps and the rungs, right? Now moving on to page 16, we're also going to use the rope to raise and lower the any tools, right, or material bag. We're not going to be ca carrying up, up with it in our hand. We're never going to rest any tools and materials on the top of the ladder uh, for a uh, step ladder. We're going to uh, move the ladder in line with the work that's going to be done, right? We're not going to lean sideways or off the ladder. A uh, good rule of thumb is always keep your belt buckle or your navel between the two rails, okay? And if you look at uh, the illustration on page 17, you'll see the 4 to 1 ratio there in figure 17 on page 16, okay? And then um, use ladders only for short periods of time, right? If we're going to be working on long periods of time, we want something like an aerial lift, uh, uh, a platform or some type of scaffold or something. Uh, we want to lay the ladder on the ground when, when we finish with it to keep it out the way, uh, if possible, right? If not, keep, have it somewhere it's secure where it won't become a fall hazard or struck by hazard. Uh, never use makeshift substitutions for ladders, right? Uh, never use straight la step ladders for straight ladders like we talked about. And then each ladder has its own desi design purpose, right? Straight ladders, extension, um, uh, excuse me, straight ladders, extension ladders, step ladders, and fixed ladders, all four of them, right? Okay. And then there's your rules for your straight ladders as well. You know, same thing, right? Checking the rails and the rungs for cracks, making sure that there are no defects. Uh, checking the entire ladder for loose uh, nails or screws or brackets or anything. Uh, making sure that the feet are securely attached as well. Um, also making sure that we set up, uh, uh, set up next uh, step is to go ahead and inspect that ladder, right? We're going to make sure that the ladder's straight, that it's got the proper angle. We're going to make sure that straight ladders... Uh, they're used on a stable level surface ground, you know, unless they're secured at both the top and the bottom, like we, like we just talked about. 
Um, and then also the distance between the, the foot and the ladder on my page 17, right on the right hand column. Um, and then, and then once we've inspected it, and then what are we going to do, right? Never tried to move the ladder with somebody on it. I mean, just typical safety concerns that we know, right? Never use the ladder as a work platform horizontally. We, a pick board is a pick board. Uh, 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 extension ladder is an extension ladder. So let me go to a pick board now, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Or a walking board, whichever one you want to call it. Some people call it a walking board or a pick board. This is what I'm talking about. That's what you should be putting between with on two ladders like this. Okay. That, that, that's a pick board, not a ladder. Okay. You can't use an extension ladder like that. So it's going to be a it's an actual walking board, and it, and that's what it's designed for. It's not a ladder. Okay. All right. And then this, folks, for anybody who's not familiar, uh, platform flanks, uh, uh, planks. They also call it a chicken board or a crawling board as well. Okay, and it's so you can have something to step on. Okay, and then um, and then let me go back to the list. Right, never using the ladder as a work platform. Make sure the ladder that we're using, um, we use it. Uh, we're we're climb it safely. Um, something that I do want to bring up is ascending and descending the ladder is when we need uh, three points of contact. We do not need three points of contact. I mean, it's great to have uh, when we're working on the ladder, but in order to work off of a portable ladder, both hands are going to have to be. Uh, in use so just just keep that in mind okay and then in addition to um in, in addition to uh making sure that the top of the ladder is firmly positioned right and then it's not going to shift we want to maintain three points of contact like i said um when climbing or ascending or descending the ladder we want to always keep our body's weight at the center of gravity we never want to go up and down the ladder while facing it uh, facing it or facing away from it and we don't want to carry tools in our hands while we're climbing the ladder either, okay? So we want to carry some type of bag, some type of pull it up after with some type of tool bag or something uh, in order to make sure that, that we stay safe, okay? And then extension ladders, uh, I'm on page 18 now, extension ladders, we have to be positioning them and securing them right. All the same ladders, are gonna, uh, all the same uh, rules are going to apply as well, that when we adjust the length of the extension ladder, we want to reposition it, right? And uh, so that we're going to push the bottom out a little bit or pull the bottom out so that we can keep that, that good, safe four to one ratio. Okay. We want to make sure that the section locking mechanisms are going to be fully hooked. So what am I talking about? Talking about those locks where you see the rung lock. Okay. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. On page 18 on, uh, on figure 21. And then make sure that all ropes, right, that we're using are in good shape as well, that they're not tangled up, uh, making sure that uh, they're easy to pull. Um, now make sure the ladders are in overall good condition, right? Uh, for ladders, uh, 36 to 48 inches long, the overlap has to be at least four feet. So, and all this is standardized and all this will tell us on the instructions of the ladder as well. Okay. And then for, uh, for, excuse me, for ladders that are 36 feet to 48 feet, we're going to have to have an overlap of at least four feet. Okay. So overlap, look at the bottom illustration of page uh, 19. That's what I'm talking about. So 36 feet, we're going to have to have a, at least a three-foot overlap. 48 feet, we're going to have to have at least a four-foot overlap, okay? And then 60 feet, we're going to have to have at least a five-foot overlap. I tell people this. This is the easiest way to remember. Remember feet compared to inches. So 36 feet is 36 inches, right? That's three-foot overlap. 48 feet, that's 48 inches. That's going to be a four-foot overlap. And then a six-foot, a 60-foot uh, ladder is going to be a six-foot uh, overlap, excuse me, 60 inch overlap, which is going to be a five foot overlap. Okay. So that's the best way I like to tell everybody how to remember that. And then of course, also your rules for your step ladders as well, right? Your do's and don'ts as well. Um, the video that you're going to watch, I'm, I'm going to let you keep on going through the, uh, you know, just read the rules for the step ladders. We all know there's some redundancy here, but very, very well needed. Um, a lot of insurance claims come from either using, and, and two of the biggest claims often on ladders are going to be from either improper use of ladder or improper ladder selection. Okay, so remember that, right? Either we're not using the ladder appropriately or we picked the wrong ladder for the job.
Okay. And then you have on page 21, you also have your do's and don'ts. That way you can just read over those as well. It's kind of all the stuff that we talked about. It's just summarized there. Okay. And then, um, and then if you look at page 25, you see a typical fixed ladder, okay? Those typical fixed ladders, folks, just so you know, they're going to meet the same standard as well, just like we do in the uh, uh, the fixed ladders are going to are going to meet the same standard that we do with um, with portable ladders. They're still going to be 12 inches between rungs. It's going to be at least 16 inches wide, okay? That bird cage, we're going to get into that bird cage a little bit deeper. And um, in the next session, I'm going to come back and talk about birdcage a little bit, but um, I don't, I don't want to muddy the water with that tonight because it's it's bird cages tend to be just a little bit complicated. OK, and um, but I'm going to get you up to speed on it because I, I want those. A, that's the newer birdcage area. As you can see, the bottom of it's flared out. So that way I'm going to go ahead and, um, and kind of get you up to speed on that after. OK, so I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to pause for just a minute, folks, since we're wrapping up ladders. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause this for just about three or four minutes. And then what we're going to do is we're going to push through the last few pages because we only have about six or seven pages left in this standard. And then um, I see a, a few of y'all falling off. I know it's kind of late already, almost nine o'clock. So I'm going to send whoever's left on it. I'm just going to go and wrap it up. And then that way, if we need to catch it up next week, we will. But anybody who wants to catch it by video tomorrow, the next day can as well. OK, so just give me a few seconds and we'll kick it back off. Okay, folks, so let's go ahead and keep it going, okay? Uh, we only got about five pages left, so we should be out of this in, uh, in some pretty decent time. And then um, before we kick off right now, let me show you some videos that I'm going to ask you to watch. And I'm going to send you the links to all of these, okay? I'll send them to everybody in the uh, in, in an email uh, in the morning. But let me go ahead and show you all the videos right now that I'm going to ask you to watch, okay? And, and this is anytime between now and next week. I think they're all great, and you'll enjoy them. Okay, the first one I'm doing Miller Fall Protection, and it's um, it's a company called Duluth. Okay, and and they're really good, which is right here. I'm sorry, Mill Supply is what it is. Excuse me, Mill Supply right here. So this is part one, and then once you play it, and then you'll find part two. And I'm not going to play it right now. I'm just going to pause it. Okay, and then when you come over here, you'll see part two in it now. And like I said, I'm going to send it to you anyway. Okay, let me see where it is now. Right here, part two, Miller Fall Protection, Basics of Fall Protection. Okay, those are two really good videos. Those, and then also, I'm going to do these two for you at Scaffold Safety. It's going to be California Workers' Compensation Fund. It's this one right here, Scaffold Safety Part 1 English. Okay, I'm going to pause it again. Okay, and then you're going to have uh, part two right here, and they talk about PPE and ladder use as well. So this is going to tie this whole section together that we've been talking about, okay, and it'll make a lot more sense. Um, there's this, uh, the NCCR, the scaffold portion isn't very big. So therefore, like I said, it's, I think these, these uh, videos are going to really help out, okay? I'm going to send you those, those four folks. That's four of them there. I'm also going to send you this one. It's Louisville Ladder. It's called the Climb Academy. I don't know if you've heard of it yet. It's a 16-minute uh, video, 15-and-a-half-minute video. This one right here. Okay, really, same thing, same thing, really, really good video as well, okay? So uh, so check that one out if you get the opportunity. I, I think you'll like it as well. And then I'm sending you those five, and then um, I'm also going to send you the two, like we said earlier in the session, the uh, electrical safety. Electrical safety CMA, which was this one right here, the one by Schneider Electric. Okay. And last of all, Lockout Tagout uh, by Pandit, okay? Uh, all great uh, product uh, manufacturers and reps also, folks. So just keep in mind, right? They're, keep them in mind. They're putting all their stuff on the Internet for us to be able to use and look at So uh, on YouTube. So just keep them in mind when, um, when it comes down time to purchase any equipment or materials, all right? Okay, so let's keep going with scaffolds, all right? So um, if you look right there, you'll, you'll, see, a, you'll see a one level scaffold on page uh, 22, okay? And guidelines that we wanna keep in mind for scaffolds, right, on the right-hand side. Things we wanna make sure that we that remember, right? Never work on scaffolding, right, or on any type of work cage or anything, unless we meet the following conditions, right? 
If we are subject to seizures, we don't want to do it, right? If we get dizzy or lightheaded easily, we don't want to do it either. Uh, if we're on any type of medication where it may affect our stability, we definitely want to make sure that we don't work on elevated work surfaces or under type of uh, influence of any types of drugs or alcohol or anything. Uh, and then also when working on any type of scaffold, we always want to follow the, sa the safety guidelines um, as you see right there on page 23 as well, right? We want to make sure that it's, uh, that it's erected. Um, according to the manufacturer's instructions, remember this, any scaffold is going to have to be assembled underneath the direction of a competent person, okay? So a qualified person will have to design it. Manufacturers are often qualified, so they send it to us with instructions for a competent person to be able to uh, build. But um, if it gets to be something beyond what the manufacturer has recommended or, uh, or given us uh, instructions on, you want to have a qualified person design your scaffold and a competent person um, oversee its assembly and disassembly and daily inspections on it as well, or any inspections after any significant events like a hard rainstorm, excessively cold weather, ice, items like that, okay? Um, also, industry best practices, right, to attach a green uh, tag, yellow tag, and red tag. I'll show you on the next page. Um, also, if scaffolding shifts, um, if the scaffolding shifts, um, we want to make sure that we exit it immediately and then we're going to have a competent person or a qualified person inspect it to determine what needs to be done. Okay, we never we want to use any type of damage, broken parts or parts that have been deteriorated. Uh, we want to follow the manufacturer's specifications and their instructions. We also don't want to interchange parts from different manufacturers unless it's permitted by the manufacturer. The reason we don't want to do that is because what happens is um, if we use, depending on the metals that the, that the manufacturers use, what happens is if you have metals that may not react well to each other, it's, uh, they can galvanize and they can, the parts of the scaffolds from one manufacturer to the other, they can kind of seize together and it becomes galvanic action. And then really the only way to get uh, to separate them is you start beating them apart. And then we're messing up, the, possibly messing up the structural integrity of them, okay? Also, we want to be able to use the seals and the base plates wherever necessary, okay? Whenever there's any soft ground conditions. Um, just follow all your manufacturer specs and all your competent person inspections, okay? And then um, on the next page, if you go to uh, flip over to page 24, I'll leave you with the rest of the list to read there, okay? For our page 24 and 25 related to scaffolds, just all the hazards. And then look at your tags right there. There's your green, yellow, and red tags. Green tag normally tells, means that we can access the scaffold without needing personal fall arrest on because all the guardrails are in place, okay? And it's been deemed that the guardrails and, all, and any other accessories that are meeting the fall protection standard. Uh, yellow uh, tag normally means that we can access it safely, but they do want us to wear fall protection. Either something's missing, or it may just be that they uh, that the employer or the or the customer wants everybody to use fall protection regardless of the guardrails. So they'll tag it yellow, and then yellow means that we ca we cannot be on it. Okay, we can't be on it because either parts are missing that are significant to the instructional integrity of it, or it may have been damaged as well. Okay, so there's all there's all your information on um, on on scaffolds as well. Okay, so if y'all can just finish reading that on your own, and then and it's all bullet pointed, which are items that we talked about in the past. Okay, thank you. Oh, okay, folks. So look, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna go ahead and we're we're well past the nine o'clock. Uh, most people had logged off. A few of you stayed on, um, but that's why I figured I didn't want to get caught in the middle of the scaffolds. So let's go ahead and shut it down for the day, okay? When we re when we reconvene next Tuesday, we're going to go ahead and reconvene on uh, aerial lifts there because there's a lot of information there. So I don't want to get into too deeply on that uh, tonight. Uh, I don't want to be rushing it on you guys. And then we're also going to get into uh, module six as well, which is steel erection. It's going to have some crane information on there. So we'll kind of cover all that motorized stuff. And then I think the next chapter after that is like uh, some motorized equipment as well, okay? So what we'll do is we'll cover all that, uh, hopefully all the motorized stuff on Tuesday and um, between Tuesday and Thursday of next week and try to capture as much of it as possible. If anybody's got any questions at all, just, you know, y'all know the drill, right? Just call me, email me, or text me, and then I'll get everybody up to speed. Anybody's got any questions, just feel free to reach out to me. So as of tonight, like I said, we're almost finished uh, module five. The only thing we have left is will be uh, powered industrial trucks or not even powered industrial trucks, excuse me, 
uh, specifically aerial lifts, okay, uh, because of the fall hazard, since we were uh, talking about more fall uh, hazards and elevated work surfaces, and we'll kick off on there on Tuesday's segment. All right, uh, thank you very much, folks. Y'all have a great night, and look forward to talking to you next week.